very Indian, you see. So we were sent down there, and I was sent to a place called Kanyangong. Kanyangong was a place we had to go 26 miles inland after going up the river uh, to a place called Tawa. Now this is where my amateur radio activities really took off. We get to uh, Kanyangong, and I received a letter from my friend Bert Smith to say that he had already got a receiver, he was fiddling about with a transmitter, and how was I getting on? Well, because I wasn't getting on at all. I had just got my junk in a box, you know, the bits I had pinched and won, you know, by fair means or foul, but I realised I had to do something. So, we moved into what were known as the Kanyangong Law Court. There had been law courts there before the war, and there were Japanese officers in them, and our fighters came over and strafed the place and got the Japs out and they ran away, and of course we took the, the building over. So I realised I should get my junk box out and try and put things together. Well, by good luck, I always carried my ARRL handbook with me and an RSGB handbook, you see, my two Bibles, you see. So I get them out and I lay them down, you see, and say, well, what can I build with what I've got here? So I said, the first thing I better build is a receiver. So I look at what I've got and I didn't know very much. But I said, well, I can maybe take some valves out of this set I bought for 65 rupees, you see, from this Canadian and something else in this piece. Well, I stripped down the um, uh, VHF set, because it was no good to me. I got valve holders and a lot of nice uh, screws. I, sh I don't know if I told you, when I opened this set up, I was very fortunate in one respect. It was not a British-made um, VHF uh, set for this hurricane. A, a number of uh, sets of this type were made under license in America for us, and they were beautifully made, you know, beautiful stainless steel bolts, uh, really nice, and they all came apart quite well. So I took them all to bits, and I used this a chassis for my little receiver. I had an old metal panel, it's a rough piece of metal, so I, I cut up and dressed up a bit. And I found an old dial, oh, which by, I think by today's uh, reckoning, would be on an old radio in this country about 1928 or something, but it was still working, and luckily I had a quarter shaft. Now, my problem was capacitors, you know, variable capacitors. So, I get started, and I say, well, I've got a 6SK7 valve here, that will be my detector in the radio the receiver, and I've got a, a 6J5, that will be the audio stage driving a pair of headphones. So I'll have a look at this, and of course I was stuck for various things. Well, I said, I've no coil formers, I didn't have any heads to plug in coil formers, so I just naturally took a valve, smashed it, and uh, an old one that was gone, and used the, the, the base and made a coil for, for 20 <coughs> meters, I thought, you see. So I got started, and uh, one of the fellows down in the WT camp said there was an old box line, and he let me see it. I said, have you carried this all the way? He says, we've carried this all the way from the Dimmerpool Road. I says, what's it for? He says, I don't know. Someone left it here. He said, is it any good to you? So I took the box up to my room, and there was one or two old, old variable classes. Some of them pretty rough by today's standards, but I could use them and clean them all up, and I had enough idea, <coughs> I guess, what uh, some maximum and minimum capacitance we'd have. So I got them all in, uh, fixed, and I put them uh, together, and uh, I wasn't quite sure uh, if there was any activity at all. But by this time, uh, I had built this little receiver, which was just a regenerative detector into one uh, audio uh, stage. And uh, I got the, the reaction going quite well, it was quite smooth. But I, had, I was hearing odd signals on it, because I had built a little power you know, with an old transformer I had been given, but again by one of the fellows in the WT. But it was very, very simple. It seemed reasonably stable. And uh, I started hearing signals, but I wasn't sure uh, if I was on the band. And here I went down again to the WT camp, and I found in a box, they didn't even know they had it, they'd been carrying it, an old RAF absorption wave meter. It was in a Paxling coil form with a very nicely calibrated dial. I would say the Air Force probably used it somewhere about 1934 or 35. It was quite ancient. But calibrated on it, he had all of the 20 meter amount of <laughs> So I said to this fellow, get used to that. He says, I said, I'll bring it back because it's probably on your inventory. He said, well, do that just in case. But he says, we've never used it. He didn't even know how to use it when I showed him it. He didn't know what it really was. I, thought. I mean, he wasn't going to be a technical part. So I took it away up and I, I, I checked it and I, I got this little receiver on the band, you see. Well, uh, this time I'm going to look the dates here because. Uh, my memory is probably getting a bit um, shaky in that I can't remember the date, but I've got the set going and I heard the first radio amateur since 1939, and it was on the 26th of October 1945, and I heard a fellow calling CQ VU2US in India, and no sooner had he signed than I heard W5BOH. That was on the 26th of October, 1945. Now, W5BOH was not probably at the school QTH. 
because most of the inhabitants I worked out there latterly, they're all in Leyte and you know in various islands, you see, in Guadalcanal, and they're using their own call centre, just telling you where they were, you see. They were good probably getting ready to go home. So I have got my receiver uh, going, you see. Well, by this time, Bert Smith in uh, India is still pressing me to see how I'm getting on. But I had lost touch with Len Flint. I was getting no mail from him at all. I thought, where could he be? He had a fellow visited my unit. And he said, there's a fellow asking for you. I said, somebody who knows me? He said, yes. He said, he was up uh, in the capture of a uh, Mandalay and Fort Dufford. I said, what's his name? He said, Len Flint. Oh, I said, he must have been posted. Oh, he says he's been away from India for a long time. I said, he wonders where you were. Oh, I said, that's great. I'll probably meet him eventually at Wing headquarters. So um, my next move was how to build a transmitter. Well, I had sneaked along one day to a twin channel VHF, and they were very nice people too. I mean, I got on well with all of you. I was a scrounger, you see. And I said to this fellow, have you anything I told you don't need to be looking for? No, I was really cheeky. I said, have you any crystals that are near 40 meters? We looked at me. <laughs> he said, oh, well, can we help you there, you see? So he gave me two crystals. He said, they're old ones. But he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I could maybe grind them into the band, you see. He said, how do, you, how do you do that? Oh, I said, the old trick. I said, you use brasso and whatnot, you see. I said, you mm-hmm. can do it. I said, you can shift them up a few cases. Oh, he said, take them, you see. He said, I don't want them back. So he gave me this. And while uh, I was getting the crystals, he had some valves out there. He'd been changing valves in part of the twin channel gate yet. And I see this valve lying over inside this glass tube. And I said, oh, do you use this type of valve in uh, your um, set? Oh, he said, yes, it's in part of the audio side of it. It was a 6L6. Oh, oh, I said, yeah, that's for me. He said, would you like one? So he gave me a 6L6, you see. So I was really on a winner, you see. But I had no other valve, you see, that I thought would make an oscillator. And of course, I wasn't sure if the crystals would work, if I could really keep them active. Usually, if you make a mistake, you, you just make them, they're no longer active. You've had it, they're a goner, you see. So I thought, I'll try the crystals later, but I'll get something going before I worry about the crystals. So I kept thinking to myself, what would be the simplest circuit, an oscillator circuit, for 40 meters? And I could use the 6 or 6 as a doubler, and that will also be my final amplifier tube for the moment, you see. So I keep looking at this, and I came up with this, and I said, ah, the simplest circuit of all is probably a Hartley oscillator, you see. Maybe not exactly stable, but it does work. So I used the valve which I had bought in the, um, uh, the, the American shortwave set, just the chassis, with a little bigger, from this Canadian who was going away. It was a, a 6K6 GTG. And it oscillated beautifully on my Hartley. That was my um, oscillator. And I used the 606 that the man in the twin channel VHF had given me. And because my transformer was so small to power it, all I got out of it was 9 watts. But one day I was passing this place, and I forgot to tell you this, when we're coming down the road, and I see this beautiful American fighter line, a thunderbolt. But I had to be careful, because we were in very, very much a... Uh, dangerous territory, you see, where the Japanese were all over the world, snipers were everywhere about, you see. And we used to have to move about, but you, like like the troop ship, with the way you never went in a straight line. If I walked from there to 100 yards away, zigzag. Well, I looked at this, and I was so tempted, we'd just stopped at the side of the road, and I thought, this is my chance. So I ran away over like this zigzag, you see, and I jumped into the, the cockpit. The plane was in beautiful condition, except that uh, uh, belly landed, you see. I don't know what had happened to the pilot. And when I was sitting looking at the um, aircraft, right in the middle of the, um, the, the instrument panel, is the most beautiful black-faced uh, uh, Western uh, instrument. It was marked on it. The Western Instrument Company, Newark, New Jersey. I could see this here. Calibrated zero to like 30 volts, I mean DC. It was a milliamethyl. It was the, probably reading the, the battery volt, you see, a master voltmeter. And a little screw, I got the three screws out, out and pulled the meter out, off of the two back thermals, into my pocket, and boy, did I run the zigzag back. I was going to lose that black meter. Oh, right. Like, and right. one fellow said, where have you been? I said, look. I said, where did you get that? I said, over there. She said, you mean your wrist? No, you're already out the old car. I said, ah, another thing from my jump box. So I had this meter. I was, going, I was keeping it for better things, you see. So I didn't use it on the 9 watt ring. Well, I get this thing all pieced together, you see. And, I mean, I knew it was on the band because I, oh, I checked it with the subsource weight meter again. And oh, one thing I, I must tell you about, because we have plenty of aerial wire, you see, of this beautiful 12 gauge wire, I decided to make my, 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 my antenna very simple. So I just put a, a long wire up 66 feet, and I had another old combatter, and I made a parallel tuned circuit, but I had no coax to get down from the window, you see. So I used the old trick which I learned from Duke Harrow when I was 12 years old. He says, you just use twisted pair. 
two bits of wire and twist it, nearly 75 ohms. So I get two good quality pieces of insulated wire and twist it, loop round it, up onto the little thing, you see. Well, a couple of characters came in who were non-technical in the because we had all sorts, we had dispatching, and they're watching me, and I've got this a, a six a volt bulb with a single loop, you see, and I'm holding it around the final tank and I'm going, and this one is <laughs> I lay the thing down and he goes, you see, and I pick it up again and, go, and I'm watching him, you see. And then I took a knee out of my pocket, a small knee, and I was running up to this holy spirit of going, and he's going, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> got it with magic, you see. So I had them all fascinated, you see. Now, must have, the, the, remember the fellow in the very old days that used to appear on the stage, was it Dr. Walford Bodie, you know, who used to do all the, the things with the electric chair and water, you'll remember this one. <laughs> I must have sounded like that to them, you know, I was doing all these tricks, you see. Well, obviously I was getting somewhere, I had some RF going up the spout, you see. So I wrote a, a quick email letter to my friend Bert Smith in Bombay, and uh, believe it or not, his letter crossed. He was ready to go. And I went, well, I was tuning about this night, you see, and I didn't hear Bert, but I was on 20 meters all right. And on the 24th of January, I've got it here, 1946, VS7QB called CQ. <coughs> I called him, and he came straight back to me. I was in business bar. I was there. Two days later, I hear Bert Smith on calling me on 20 meters, and I went straight by to him, and that was it. And I was watching him every odd week, every odd day. We had this thing going, you see. Well, it went on and on, and I was thoroughly enjoying it there, you see. But of course, we realised we'd probably have to move into Wing, in, into wing Headquarters in Rangoon. But I worked a lot of stations there with this little 9 watt uh, rig, and they seemed to be hearing me very, very well. Now, I would admit my receiver was pretty primitive, but I, I was getting there. I was being heard, you see. So at the end of the day, I wrote to Bertsmith and I said, we'd probably be moving, but when I get into Wing Headquarters, I'll probably get even more established there, and I'll have a... Um, various things going, and I'll probably be able to get a better a transmitter. So Bertsman said, might I ask, what did you use for the, the valves in the, the transmitter? Oh, I said, I used a 6K6 GT, which I, I got out of an American radio, bought from a Canadian, and I had a 6L6. Says, that was all. He says, my gosh, you're doing very well. Well, let me just show you something. That is the valve which I got out of the and it is still working to this day. That's the 6K6. Yeah, I put it in this little stand, that's for sure. Still going. So delivering RF. Yeah. So when I actually got going, one thing I, I really meant to mention to you, when I was down in the WT uh, cabin, one of the fellows said, have you got a Morse key with you being an amateur? I said, no. He unscrewed the chrome key, which he had got from McGuinness. There it is. He says, there's a present to you. McGuinness's key. So I used that all the time. So that's where that, that came from. That's the actual key that McGuinness, the Canadian, it's a VE3 or a VE2, I'm not sure, but he left it, so I inherited it, and I used it all the time for my equipment. So this was the start of my um, uh, activities. When we eventually dismantled there, I just put everything in a box, and then, um, well, I, one thing I, I should tell you too, uh, the time base in our uh, radar uh, re receiver, I had forgotten about it, because I had to be very careful, because the spares we had there, um, were um, valuable in that we sometimes had little spares of certain types of all, and I couldn't really take them because it might have put my station off the air. And quite often when we were up uh, in the field and we were desperate for equipment, we sent a, a radio message and we put a marker out and a few aircraft would come over and drop stuff there. So they were dropping all sorts of things that were big shoots. If we, the shoots came down in colours. You'd maybe get a white shoot with a green band on it or a green stripe, and that might be... Um, uh, Food. The next one might be red stripes, that was medical supplies. The next one maybe a black stripe, that was ammunition. And they were even dropping jeeps to us eh, with big six cluster shoots. They just threw them out of the aircraft and even come down and get another jeep. Well, we sent eh, a signal to say we were short of certain spares, you see. And eh, I always remember this. When we got out and the stuff started to come down, we're looking at the very the radar spares on the jeep. We're pulling all the stuff in, you see, and came and opened this box. There was a box of RCA 807. So I said, that is for me. <laughs> so I had an 807. Well, when I got back to my shack, you see, I looked at this and I said, what do I do now? So I built, because I had no room left in the chassis, I had a little box about four inches square, and I bolted it on the side of the chassis, put a valve holder on it, and another tank set. And the, the 6L6 became my, my doubler come driver into the world. And again, because I hadn't a great lot of uh, volts DC-wise, I could only get 27 watts out of the, um, 
the eight or seven, that I was really going then, they were really hearing me, just even that, I, went to that I, mean, I was getting characters <coughs> calling me in Manila and, everything like that, and VK and all this thing, man, goodness, what are you using? Just this little set, you see. So eventually, I had to dismantle it, you see, and uh, we went in to, um, to Wing Headquarters. And as a result of going into Wing Headquarters, I meet Len Flint, he was already there, he'd come down another way from uh, the, the capture of a uh, man Malay. So we got our heads together and I said, there's a room upstairs there, I said, doing nothing. I said, I'm going to have a word with the CEO and see if you'd let me put a lock on it, you see. And I said, there's a window there. We could make a nice shack, you and I, you see. And I said, I've got a lot of loot like, laid away that no one knows anything about, you see. So I said, I'd be clever. And I said, I've got a few eight or sevens too, you see. So I said, oh, that's great. So I had a word with Jack Moore. I said, sure to do it. He said, you just say to him, I give you permission, you see. So that was it. So we locked the door and put a padlock thing on it. And uh, we got an antenna up outside. And we built a uh, rig, which was a bit more um, elaborate. Uh, it actually it was a, a pair of um, eight or sevens in parallel. Again, I had to put it again suitable main transformers, even in wing headquarters. But I got a reasonable amount of power out of it. And I mean, I was working the world from there. The only country I had difficulty in uh, 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 contact, strangely enough, it might have been my antenna, was Africa. Africa was very difficult, yes. And another very interesting thing, I always remember the night I was sitting with Len Flint. And we were always hoping that the Americans would get their licenses back, first of all, you know, legitimate licenses. And of course, we could hear the, the West Coast radio stations, you know, their normal broadcast stations as well. And I said, we might possibly hear um, some of the first American amateurs to come up on the air. Well, this night, I was listening. And I remember this call vividly because I used to hear him as a boy on 10 meters and something in 20, a tremendous signal. W6GRL from Ventura, California. He was one of the big wheels with Don Wallace, you know, W6AM. He and Don Wallace were the great fellows in all the contests. Now, you know, they had rhombics and you name it, they had everything, you see. He was, a, uh, he was known as a, uh, what was his name? He was a doctor of um, dentistry. That's right, it's called 6GRL. And um, the interesting thing about it was, while I was listening, and I had said to Len Flint, you know, Sammy, I hear this call. This W6 calling CQ, it was 6GRL. I called him, he came straight back to me, and I always remember what he said. He said, say old man, it's wonderful to hear XZ again for the first time since the, the hostilities, you see. He said, the world is hearing you tonight. He said, I can hear all the boys in the West Coast ganging up in here, right up through uh, VE, VE7, everything, a lot. He said, they're all waiting their turn. He said, I'm getting the heck out of it, and good luck. Well, the interesting thing is, oh yeah, that's right, his name was Doc Stewart. Uh, and he lived in Tassie Ventura, California. Well, I got a write-up in QST as a result of this, usually. And uh, in 1990, when I was in California, and I was asked to uh, address the Southern California DX Club, and of course, the reason I was asked was, I was invited there as a guest, but the main speaker failed to turn up, and they asked if I could say something, and they said, would you speak about your amateur radio film? So I spoke. And uh, in the actual... Um, in the actual uh, room I was sitting in, the um, room was straight forward in front of me. Great seats, well maybe just over a hundred uh, amateurs sitting there. And I had said that as I had no notes, um, would it, it be all right if uh, anyone wishes to ask me a question, not to wait till the end, just put their hand up and I'll stop speaking, you see. Well, I'm talking away and I came to this bit about W6GRL, how I was fascinated, having heard him as a boy, never thinking I would work him under such conditions, you see. And he said, of course, that I was the first ex said to he had heard the work since the, the, the war, you see. And suddenly an old boy in the front, there were two rows back, put his hand up like this, you see. And I just thought, I said, yes. <coughs> he says, you have an amazing memory. He said, you are correct. Doc Stewart lived in Ventura, California. He said, he's now deceased. He was W6GRL, a very famous radio amateur. He said, he and I were very close friends. We got our licenses together. He said, it's wonderful that you'd remember this. And he came up and spoke to me after the old chap. And he was thrilled to know. And he said, I remember, he told me he had worked Burma, he said, just in the early days after the war. So there were things like this um, it went on. And of course, once we got really uh, established, uh, as I say, things sort of started uh, to um, uh, happen. And as I say, I contacted... Um, Various countries, uh, we were working into Europe, all over the place, and uh, as I say, it was surprising really uh, how much um, we could actually um, uh, do with fairly sort of primitive uh, equipment. And of course, uh, uh, 
The other thing was we started to, to contact one or two stations who were very, very famous. I mean, 6GRL was famous, but one of them, which uh, I contacted, and of course um, he was uh, at that time uh, the, the rarest station in the world in Zone 23, that was AC4YN. Uh, and of course, um, Red Fox was known throughout the, the world, but you see, he was the only station there in Zone 23 at that time, and he was in Lhasa in Tibet. And uh, we used to speak to him at night there, and he's a, a very, very interesting man. And um, as I say, I have here one of the rarest QSLs in the world, AC4 YN, which I got from him. But we had various other QSLs, but uh, a strange thing developed with AC4 YN. Another fellow appeared on the scene, a fellow called Bob Ford. AC3 SS, he was in Sikkim, and then he was in Tibet, and we wondered what he was doing. He was an XRAF fellow, and apparently, uh, a Red Fox AC4 YN had recruited him because the Tibetan authorities were worried about the Chinese presence, you know, there would be trouble. So he set up, this fellow Ford set up various stations, but he had an amateur station, and we used to contact him quite a lot, but he appeared with different call signs, and a very, very pleasant fellow. And um, when the Chinese did eventually overrun uh, Tibet, he was caught, and he got seven years in jail, and the thing that convicted him was his logbook with entries from me and the other amateurs around him. That's what he got. They said, they said it was court, which well, it probably was. But just let me give you an example. This book here, which is Seven Years in Tibet by Heinrich Harrer, that's a German who escaped, a civilian, and escaped and got into, um, into Tibet. This just gives you an idea of the things people they print. It just has here, the British staff were replaced by Indians, but Mr. Richardson stayed on until September 1950. As the Indians had no trained candidate for the post, Reginald Fox was taken over by the Tibetan government as their radio operator. He was instructed to put up wireless stations at all important strategic <coughs> points, as the danger of a surprise invasion by the forces of Red China was growing daily. A trustworthy man was needed for Chando, a focal point in East Tibet. And Fox brought in a young Englishman named Robert Fox. He was an ex-RAF person. I knew him slightly at Lhasa. He was fond of dancing and introduced the samba to Lhasa. At, the, at Tibetan parties, there was a good deal of dancing. National dances, not unlike those of northern states, were the most popular, but the foxtrot was also favoured, though it was frowned upon by the elderly people. Those who thought it unseemly partners should cling so close together. Ford went off with a large caravan to Chando, and one could soon talk to him on the wireless telephone. It appears that radio amateurs all over the world competed for the privilege of talking to the lonely European in his remote outpost. And Ford and Fox received shows of letters and presents, I presume the men QSL card former. Unfortunately, the notes that Ford made of these harmless conversations later proved his undoing. On his flight before the Chinese invaders, he was cut off and captured. The wildest charges were brought against him. He was accused, among other things, of poisoning a llama, and the entries in his notebook, that is his logbook, were innocent, were his innocent young was still a prisoner in the hands of the Reds, in spite of efforts by the British ambassador in Peking to get him to release. As I say, he got seven years for what was in that book, all because we had made contact with him, and that was it. So this is the sort of thing. And uh, we, we received various other cards. I have one here, and a very, very interesting letter came from it. This one was from China. C3WY, operator a CS Chen, and it's got a care of a China National Aviation Corporation Fu Chow. And he's got all the details on the back, you know, amateur radio station to us to exit to GS my signal 14 Meg when it was on the 7th, 4th of June 1946, which tells you about his transmitter. But in with it was a letter, and I think this is a, a GM, it's priceless. Now, I really should laugh at a person's English because I do not speak Japanese, Chinese, or any dialect. So um, uh, you just take this as I give you it. When we got this, I mean, it was really priceless. It's marked on the top, uh, C3WI, China National Aviation Corporation, Fu Chow, China, August 21st, 1946. Now, my friend Len Flint was handling the QSL, you see, I left that to him. Dear Flint, old boy, hi. Your confirmatory letter dated 9th June 1946 Lee received a long time ago but I can reply you just now because I think you will have not able home arrived too early. <laughs> Here with enclosed my QSL card which was printed before long and only of rough job. My X meter is crystal controlled at 6 AC7 to buffer 6 AC7 to doubler 807 and two final 813s in parallel. It is all right at 14 megacycles. I worked 26 countries since May. 
due to power source limitation, I can work on the bands at between 0900 and 1200 GMT on Tuesdays to Thursdays in the week. My receiver is a signal core BC779B 16 tubes. There was noisy background when I worked with you, and your SIGs got swinging. <laughs> it was 3 to 5 KC shifted. I suppose year power is gone. Regulation is questioned. Yes. My antenna for X meter is single fed half wave erected about 45 feet above the ground. My station is situated in airfield here and surrounding is clear. Very pleased to QSOU for the first uh, CW station in Burma, Flint, old boy. And I am glad to know you are going back to your sweat home, S W E A T, <laughs> sweat home, England. Wishing you good luck and happy journey. Hope to see you again on the air from your home, a uh, home set, Flint. We'll sure look for you sometimes. Seventy feet to you and all yours, dears. Sincerely yours, a uh, S H A Chen, and he's got underneath it X. XU6A, that was a well-known station in uh, China before the war, a real old timer. That fellow has really been around. But this was the sort of letter. Now, I really should laugh at it, but I always find it sort of quite amusing. Here's another one from I1KN, VU2AK. Uh, I'll let you see the lot of them. VK, VS1VU, LU6AJ, W7ES. VK3JE. Ah, here's an interesting one. <coughs> VS7ES. When I tell you this fellow's name, do you recall a number of years ago a gentleman from Ceylon had a, a big insurance racket going in this country and was convicted? What was it? Fire and something? Dr. Emil Savundra. Ah, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> he was a well known radio ham in um, Ceylon in his home country. But his full name is Savundra with a great lot after it, so he must have got rid of this other bit, but this is his proper name, and he lived in number 5, Ellibank Road, a Havelock Town, Colombo, Ceylon, and he signed it, and he, he was using a National 120XRX, and he's just gotten it, in, a, his transmitter was CO something PA, input 250 watts, and that's it, and all that information, <coughs> and he's got it on the back. So that was the fellow, uh, here's another one, KE1AY, uh, what's this one? W7JB, uh, and this one uh, is just a letter, and here's another one, another um, W6. So quite a lot of things uh, were sort of going on, and of course, uh, once we once we were we were uh, heard on the air, and people got to know us. We got quite a lot of contacts uh, just through having made contact before. For instance. Two people who were always on the band, and we also had good AQSOs with them, CR9AN and CR9AG, they were in um, Macau, and uh, they had, a, I, I presume, hidden their equipment from the Japanese, because they came up with good national equipment, which they couldn't buy, and I mean, the, the American forces wouldn't have the stuff they had, you know, truly amateur stuff, and they were always on the air, very, very active, and very, very keen to have a contact with you. So, uh, as time went on, we became more and more involved, and of course, um, we didn't really have um, a great lot uh, to do, and of course, by this time, uh, the things, things were changing. The, the war, of course, uh, was over, the, the um, atom bomb went down, and uh, I always remember uh, when it happened, uh, a man uh, came to me, and it was a strange thing. I had never heard the last post before in, in real, my mother was maybe at a, a cenotaph or something like that, and I heard this bugle going. And I said to myself, that's it, like an army bugle. And it was sort of coming down the line. And it was the last post. This was it, the Japanese had surrendered. And when we heard this, a fellow came running out from my unit, he must have had a radio <coughs> on. He says, the Japanese have capitulated. That's it, they're finished. They, they've had enough, you see. So um, a man, another fellow came running out. And I remember he shook me by my hand. And another one, he, he put his hands right <coughs> like a child. And he kept saying to me, we have survived. We have survived, which was true. We had survived. And I mean, I knew at that moment the death and the killing, it was all over. That was it finished. We'd sleep well that night. And of course, it made a tremendous difference you know, to everything that was happening out there. And of course, um, life became much, uh, shall we say, <laughs> much more uh, easy in, in more ways than one. For instance, I used to go to go swimming more in the lake, at Victoria Lake. And one rather interesting thing happened to me. One day, Led Flint was on the air and he was working some DX on. I said, I'm way down for a swim. So I get into the water, and it was very quiet, and I said I would swim away across to the lake, the other side, and lie down and have a rest, because it was a fair distance, and maybe rest for 10 minutes and swim back. So I'm going along the, the edge of the water, and swim away out to get across, you see, and I 
lie down in the edge and I go up to the other side. And that wasn't about time I went back, you see. So I swim back, but I, I still thought it was rather quiet. So as I was clambering out of the water, a fellow came running down to me and he said, have you not read orders? I said, no, what's wrong? He said, go up and read orders. So I go up and read orders and it said on it, bathing prohibited from now until further notice. And I said, and why is this? He said, there's a crocodile in the lake. Oh, oh, just oh, eating oh, the dopey water. Oh, I said, how can we have a crocodile? They don't have crocodiles in the lake. No, he said. The Japanese went down to the botanic gardens and they found a, a crocodile. They put it in a big truck and tied it all up and chucked it in there when we were swimming. So I think I can truthfully, oh, oh. truthfully say I have bathed in, in a crocodile infested <laughs> water. <laughs> but I did have no idea. So I was, I was just having one escape after the other, you see. So things like this uh, uh, happen. And I mean, uh, when I think of it now, it's quite funny, but here am I merrily swimming along, you see. And the, the, the strange part about it was, you, I really never found out whether they caught this thing, but immediately they were alerted. We had a great big launch line down there called the Jean, or beautiful big thing. It originally belonged to the Burmese River Police, and it was down in the, the water near the harbour, and the Japanese had brought it up there for pleasure, and we repaired it. A, it was made in Dumbarton, of all places, with a Kelvin engine, I remember that. They got out with all sorts of guns. They had elephant guns, they had Sten guns, they had machine guns, and they're way up looking for this thing. I don't know if they ever found it, but as I say, I said they never went in bathing there again. You know. But as I say, that was the sort of, um, the sort of things which um, uh, it happened. The um, other thing I got involved in, which I didn't mention, and this is uh, very interesting, when we were at uh, this place called Kanyangong, a man came to see us one day, a Burmese, who was very well dressed. You could usually tell by the quality of the clothing he had, even though in the sort of national costume. And he spoke very good English, and he said he had a radio which the Japanese had tim uh, tinkered with when uh, the first uh, invaded the southern part of Burma. And we said, well, what's wrong? We well, said, they took it away, and I can only hear the broadcast bands now. I can't hear the shock waves. They said, we were only allowed to listen to Japanese-controlled radio. So um, he said, would it be any help if I brought it up? Maybe someone could look at it. So my CEO said, bring it up. So he said to me, what about having a deck right? So it was a beautiful set, or an export Phillips, an American one. Lovely set. True enough, it was only working on the one band. So I opened it up, and I discovered that whoever had done it, to be fair to the Japanese, he was obviously a, a good technician. He hadn't destroyed anything. He had, he had clipped out all the wiring on the oscillator coils on all the shockwave bands, and including the mixer side of it, you see. Well, uh, I had no wiring diagram, but I tried to work out the sequence of the switch, but I had about six or seven shockwave bands, and luckily I got it, and I got it firing up. And even the calibration, I hadn't been going for three and a half years in the shockwaves. It worked beautifully, of course, he was thrilled. And the work went around this place called Kanyangong. They were bringing me radios and everything, and the only one I failed to fix I was fixing American Lincolns, a Pies of Cambridge, AC Cosser, Murphy's. Uh, the only one I failed to fix, oh, I even fixed a listen. Remember the old listen set? I even fixed that. One fellow came up to me and he said, oh, I have a lovely radio. He said, I don't think it's so lovely. No, I said, why not? He said, when the Japanese came, he says, I thought I was cute. He said, they all left the radios in the house. He says, I took mine in a great big sack and I hid it down by the river. He says, here, the Japanese have a river boat there every day and I couldn't get down. It's been lying there for three and a half years and he brought the set out of the bag to me and all the coils, now they're all green spots, and rotten. I just gave it back, I said, sorry. I mean, I let the man see, I could do nothing. But I managed to get them all going with, with one exception, you see. So, one of the last times uh, I was in contact with um, my friend Beth Smith before uh, we finally uh, wound up, and I just remember there's two things, actually. He was transmitting, and he suddenly stopped. And I thought, oh, he's blown up, his, his, his transmitter's failed, something's gone wrong, you see. And he was back, quickly, so picking up, he says, sorry, William, sorry. And then he relates this story. He said, a fellow knocked at my door and I said, come in. And I looked at, I said, I recognize them from the unit. He says, because it's a big unit here. But he said, I knew he was a fellow Scot, you see, he was a Scot. He said, just hang on a moment. I'm in touch with a, a friend of mine, a Scot, who's in Rangoon. He said, he comes from a town called Stirling. And this fellow says, oh, does he now? He says, I know the fellow's name. <laughs> and he bets and says, how do you know him? He said, I'll tell you his name. He told him my name. That nearly painted. This is when he sort of fell off the key, you see. And he said, how, how do you know him? He said, I was in his class at the school in Stirling. He said, I'm a twin. My name is Glenn Good. He says, we live in Forest Road down near Riverside School. And he says, my brother David Good's outside in the next room. <coughs> what a coincidence. Eh? And the other, the, other, the other rather strange thing which happened, one of the times we were up country, and I really forgot this, because this is quite an interesting one too, when we were up country, um, we were moving into an airfield just to sort of have a slight rest, as we thought, you see. But here, the airfield uh, had just been uh, uh, 
they opened up, cleared up the Japanese, but the Japanese were at the far end of the earth, they started to counter-attack. But they had left all the lovely foxhole, the Japs could dig in well, so we were all told to take cover. And I jumped into this foxhole, and I didn't realise at the time when I jumped in, there was a fellow already in the hole, an RF regiment fellow, and I apologised, because I think I almost clipped him in the jaw with my boot, you know what I mean? He says, hang on in, it's going to be rough. So we were both jammed in this foxhole, and he started to talk to me. And I said, would I be correct in saying you come from Northern Ireland? He said, why do you say that? I said, well, I'm stationed in Northern Ireland on a radar uh, site. And I said, I can hear your accent. He said, you're right enough. I do come from Northern Ireland, you see. And I, in all innocence, said to him, oh, yes. I said, my young brother, uh, who is in the British Army somewhere in Europe, I know not where, but he's in the, the war. I said, he is called after a man in Northern Ireland. I said, my old grandfather, my mother's father, had a great pal in Glasgow, and this man came from a uh, Balamina. <coughs> oh, yes. He said, and what is your brother's name? Well, I said, my brother's first name is James, but his second and middle name is not Roddy, as we call him, it's Rodden, R-O-D-E-N, one D. He said, oh, yes. And he says, and what was this man's name uh, 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 your, uh, your brother was called after? I said, oh, it was my, my grandfather's great pal, you see. He said, well, what's his second name? I said, the man... His name was Rodden Shields, no D. He says, I have good news for you. The man is my next door neighbor. <laughs> and I meet him in a foxhole in the ground, uh, miles from nowhere. So this is the sort of things that um, uh, happened. But um, uh, latterly, uh, when I, I really got established, uh, I drew an 1155 receiver because one day, um, it was a, a, a new one, one day, and I mean, that's a pretty old hat today, but it was, it was good enough then for what I was using it for. One day, I, um, <laughs> I was down at the front, and we had two diesels mounted there, feeding all the wing headquarters, and someone pulled up in a bed for truck and walked away and left it, you see. But when I looked in the back of the bed for truck, there was nothing in it other than a rack and an 1155 on a shock mount. There was nothing in it. It wasn't wired, it wasn't coupled up to anything, no power supply. Well, I realized where this had probably come from. Just before the war had ended, uh, a lot of the um, vehicles were being re because we were going to the invasion of Japan. I was actually on the, the first lot that were going in, you see. I didn't know that at the time, but I found out after. And this vehicle probably came from this thing which had been cancelled. So when no one was around, I had a look at it. I thought, no one's coming here to set. So I went <laughs> inside it again, out with it in a way, and I just put it up. I laid it down in my shack. He said, what's this? It looked fish as if it had been there all the time. You see, this fellow drove his truck away, and he hadn't washed his 155. But when he had, it was probably someone down the road who had stolen it. He would probably he'd be cursing some native Burmese man, you see, for having pinched his 155. So I had it. And then Flint and I got it going up. We've got an old power pack for it, got it going. And then I remembered I had this um, a box with the, um, the old chassis from the, uh, the, the, cab, uh, the case, this aluminium box from the uh, old Dakota. So I screwed the thing on, the front panel on it, and I got my ARL, uh, ARL handbook out, and I said to a fellow, is that an old radio you've got? It's an old American Zenith, this has been a good one. I said, I wonder if the IS is not a 465. Said, Would you like them? I said, sure. I said, what about the little speaker on it too? It's just taken all on. Well, I took them out, and they were lovely 465, top quality IS. So I looked at the circuit in the ARL, ARL handbook, a six tube uh, super, and I built it on that um, a chassis, and it worked beautifully. And as I say, I actually got a beautiful great big velvet Werner dial. We had <laughs> an attachment once before we came in from the battlefront. Uh, an American radar appeared, but in RAF hands, and this man said to me, I've got an awful lot of spares, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Just open the box and I'll help you. Well, the first thing I noticed was this national box, you know, NC on it, you know. I had the dial right away and all sorts of things. You just take what you like. So I was just helping myself, you see. So I got to all this stuff and I made this um, single signal uh, super. It was designed by one of the, the famous editors of QSD in the past, you know, someone like W1DX or something like that, you know, Don Mix or something. And as I say, it worked very, very well. So I had a lot of things like uh, uh, this um, uh, going. But um, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, People have no idea what it was really like out there. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but when I give you an, a, an example of some of the things that, that have happened, or the conditions, I mean, a, men were living, fighting, and dying in temperatures in excess of 138 every day. And when the rain came, I lay outside for two years 
during the monsoon outside night and day when you're having a rest there was no cover it rained or that because we were fully operational there was nowhere you could go you couldn't shelter in the day because all day because we were probably working on doing this you just lay down anywhere I closed something I never had my clothes off for six weeks my boots fell off but the day I got into Rangoon I came down the final road off that day we were working for mines the soles were off my boots and I had string on them and insulated tape my feet were flapping like this like that I thought it was, I, I was swimming or something, you know, the, the big frogman job. <coughs> it was things like that. And Phil had just no idea what could you, and I mean, there were people much worse off than ourselves. I mean, the army people just ahead of us must have had a terrible time with it, you know. I mean, it really must have been very, very bad. But by and large, people didn't complain. They just got on with it. It was part of the, the, the job, you know. And as I say, uh, when I think of it now, I was probably one of the fortunate ones because I had something here, a hobby, to keep me interested, you know, something I could do. But quite a lot of the people, they couldn't believe that other people on the wing and that they had got all this going. And I said to one fellow, well, I've just been speaking to a fellow in America. He says, with that? I said, yes. Yeah, they just couldn't understand. Because they were radio hands, I mean, let, let's be fair about that. But uh, as I say, I, I, I did manage to, um, I did manage to work a, quite a lot of um, a people and a, a, quite a number of sort of interesting interesting things uh, happened. The only other thing which um, uh, basically happened was um, when uh, we were due to come home, this is quite uh, interesting, Bert Smith said that he was going home on a later ship, you see, but this is actually before we actually moved, and he said, uh, I'll, I'll probably get in touch with you when you get back to England, because I'll probably never see you again, see, other than, you know, when we get, get home. So, um, when uh, things started to fold up, and uh, most of the uh, amateur radio uh, activity was in other hands. I mean, the naval units started to set up. They were using BC 610s, you know, half kilowatt rigs and all this. And most of them were not amateurs at all. You could tell by their conversation they didn't know anything about the Q code or, you know, they were just completely ignorant of it. But anyway, they were getting fun uh, out of it. And uh, as I say, as time went on, it was difficult to know just who was working what or where the equipment was coming from. But there was a lot of things uh, uh, going. And of course, the other thing was, when I was speaking about the um, conditions uh, out there, every day when we were in the battle area, which of course was very much, it was very heavily uh, malarial, we always had to take tablets. You took a metacrine tablet, which was a, a synthetic tablet to replace quinine, because the Japanese had captured most of the world's quinine when they got the Far East. The rest of the quinine in the world was in South America, and the South Americans weren't keen to sell it because they needed it themselves. So uh, the British and the Americans got together and they, they made this uh, tablet called uh, the Metricon, a bright uh, um, colored uh, yellow tablet, rather like sulfur. And uh, the other two tablets we had to take, we took a salt tablet every day and we took a, a vitamin tablet. And you always had to take your Metricon tablet because if you got cut off from your unit and you couldn't uh, get any treatment and you had malaria, you were quite off the gunner because you, you, you just didn't last the pace. And I have here, the little tin which I carried in my pocket. I always carried two things, a field dressing next to my revolver, and I carried this tin so I was cut off. I was reasonably safe. And I still have the last of my metacrine in it, which I can shoot you. That's what we have to take. Now, by taking that, when the light started to fail at night, and you were outside, if you put your arms up like that, you were bright yellow in there, bright yellow down there. When I came home, when my mother looked at me at the front door, she says, what has happened to you? She could see it in my skin. I said, the doctor said it will go away in six months, and true enough, it, went away. it affects the pigment of your skin, but I never got malaria. I took one every day. So this is the sort of thing you had to put up with. You, you had to take that. Yeah. And it was a chargeable offence, all ranks, if you, didn't, if you didn't take it. If you went into a hospital and they checked, because they could tell if you'd been taking it, and they said, why have you not been taking malaria? You're like a physician. You were nailed right away charitable offence, because they said, yeah, and it's even got inside the label there, what it is, there's a little label stuck in there, I only found that out tonight, and I looked closely there, and I opened it, you see, so there were things like this, but what I was going to say was, like everything else, sort of, all good things um, come to an end, and as I say, I don't know, it, my problem now is, what I'm describing to you here, I'm carrying so much of it in my head, you see, and uh, I suppose, with time, your mind I'm not saying it's wandered, but you just don't maybe carry so much of the sharper things, the things that you would normally have, and you maybe forget a lot of the things. So I hope what I've generally described to you gives you an idea of just what I was sort of up against and how I got to even, uh, going. But uh, one or two interesting things in the final uh, sort of stages, 
And we always wondered what would happen to Bert Smith, because Len Flint and I he realised we'd probably go home together, you see. We're about the same age, you see, and the same length of service, roughly. So we realised we'd probably be on the boat um, together. Well, when I had to uh, pack everything up and start sort of putting things together, I thought to myself, now, what do I do now? So I just had to leave my transmitter. I just left everything I had, and uh, of course I couldn't bring it home. And um, what really uh, uh, happened was this. Uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, out there, and you could, I got a lot of small parts, and the things I was able to bring home, capacitors and things that you couldn't buy here, which I was just throwing away. And of course, I got, I got things like that. But um, the final thing was, we, we kept saying, I wonder what's going to happen to Beth Smith. Well, we were duly told that he would be put on draft for being repatriated to the United Kingdom. So we had a lot of things to do and to clear up, you know, the usual uh, things. And um, I thought to myself, well, We've had a good time, really. I survived. I've been lucky. So have the others. A lot of them haven't been lucky. Well, we eventually uh, sailed from uh, Rangoon, and we were well out into the ocean, and the captain of the ship got a signal to say that instead of going to Aden and coming right up the Red Sea and into the Med and home, we are being diverted to Bombay because our ship wasn't full. They had about 200 odd berths empty, and there were a lot of area personnel waiting to go um, to uh, the UK. So what actually happened was this. We pulled into uh, Bombay, and uh, we were in there maybe an afternoon, and I was sitting, I think, reading, and Len Flynn was writing a letter. And I had someone coming down the stairs where I was sitting at this table. And a fellow walked over, and he apologized for disturbing me. He said, I'm looking for a fellow by the name of Jürgen. And I looked up and I thought, I wonder what this is, you know, I've been in the service long enough, you know, not to volunteer for anything. <laughs> and I, said, <laughs> I said, why are you asking for this gentleman by name? He said, I have been sent down here by Bert Smith. <laughs> and yeah, Ledford gives me the old nod, you see, oh yes. You see, and I said, what's he sent you for? I wanted to make sure it was on the up and up, you see. He said, he heard you were on the ship, <coughs> and he said, if you can get off the ship tonight or tomorrow night, we can all have dinner in Bombay. I said, you go back and tell Len Flint, uh, 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 Bert Smith, Len and I, he's sitting beside me here, uh, we'll be off the ship, and we'll come up and we'll have dinner. And I said, could I ask you a question? I said, I heard you coming down the stairs there, so I presume you just boarded the ship and walked straight down here. I said, how many people did you speak to before you came down here? He said, no one. I just came forward and spoke to you. 4,000 people in to pick me out. <laughs> I don't know. Len Flynn couldn't believe it. I couldn't either. And when we told Bert Smith that night, went out and had dinner. Well, a very interesting thing happened. We got up to, to Bert's quarters. And he had this nice bed and all this stuff. And it was awfully tidy, you know. Because I had been sleeping on the ground. And I couldn't believe, oh, it's lovely, a bed, you know. And I couldn't believe it. And he's just going like this and pressing it, and then when it's looking under, <laughs> you will look under, there's a great big grey box, and literally a big area of weight meter box, and he pulls out with two big handles, and he opens it up, there's his rigging, a beautiful big transmitter and a receiver, log book, Morse key and everything, you see, and he, he took a photograph of it, and he made it into a QSL card for me, and he signed it, and I've got it in my book here, and I'll let you see it, it's quite funny, and it's the whole thing in this box, which he still had, that's what are you going to do with that stuff, take it at home, I said, how are you going to get that home, I said, I'll write on it, air ministry property or something, like that. <laughs> not wanted on voyage or something, and he had all this stuff, you see, well, we were fascinated with this, so, as I say, as time, as time went on, eh, we had actually eh, a very, very pleasant evening, we were talking about the day we all met, you know, in England, and what had happened on the ship, and all the things, and this and that, you know, and of course, we had a, a real, a uh, real good uh, time uh, of it, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but, eh, as I say, when uh, uh, we um, finally got to home, uh, Len Flint and I, uh, it was strange, you know, to be back. Uh, Len Flint was a very honest person. Once we were home, uh, or sometime after, he wrote me a letter, and he said, uh, I miss you. And it was a strange thing for a man to say. He said, I miss you. He said, when I was with you, he said, you always knew what to do. He said, you kept me right. He says, you could build that transmit, you could do this. And he says, he said, I so much enjoyed being with you. He said, you were like my brother. And true enough, I, I liked him. He was an awfully nice fellow. 
And as I say, we got on awfully well. Bert Smith was nice too. Bert Smith was a quieter. Well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the word doer because that was un unkind. But he wasn't so outgoing as in Len. Len was a, a character in his own way, you know, a particularly nice fellow. I mean, I, I like both of them. And as I say, he wrote this letter to me and he said this. And I he always admired what he said because I thought a man who probably wouldn't say that of another man, but he did. He just said that we had been together so long, you know, and we got through all this. And of course, they, we were great, great friends. And as I say, eventually uh, we came uh, home, and uh, as I say, well, things were different. But uh, the thing I all, always uh, remember when I when I sort of get uh, to um, this stage and I think about my talk. And I look, I look back and I say, well, as I say, it was a great experience, and fortunately I, I survived. But in, like everything else, it's something in your life. It just, it just happens. You know, you, you, you just sort of, I suppose, take a lot of the things for in, uh, granted. But when I look, look back, I should always think and remember uh, Len Flynn and Bert Smith, because if it hadn't been for them, they gave me so much encouragement to get on the air from the London Exit to, I mean, Bert Smith really pressed me with letters. He always said, when are you getting going? And I, I'll never forget this, because he really did. He made me move and do something about it. And as I say, unfortunately, I am the only one left of the trio. Len died about 20 years ago, and Bert died about 10 years ago. But as a result of our meeting such a long time ago, I'm still in touch with their families to this day became very close friends, and I still hear from them every odd month. They keep in touch with me, even their children they keep in touch with me. And as I say, I think it's always been something that I met the two just by sheer chance because we were radio hams. And of course, the other thing I must always uh, remember is this. Uh, when I think of the people who didn't survive, the ones who didn't get home, and I always remember the wording on the monument at Kohima Ridge, where so many of them fell. And it just says this. This is the wording on the monument. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we give out today. I was one of the fortunates. I got a tomorrow. But for so many, it was a very short day. Thank you very much, gentlemen. But just before I uh, stop and let you see um, <coughs> my various bits and pieces, and if you have any questions, uh, could I just relate one thing which happened to me when I was saying goodbye to Len Flint on the railway station at Preston? We both uh, arrived at the station fairly early for our respective trains, and I looked at my timetable and I told him, that, Oh, Len said, My train's much later than I said, But I'll come to your platform and see you off, and I'll go and have a cup of tea and catch my train for Ipswich. This was duly done, and of course it was the old type of carriage, it was quiet, I jumped into my compartment, you see, pulled the window down with the big strap, you know, and was leaning out, and Len's talking away, again we're still uh, gassing about amateur radio, what sort of rig we're going to build and all, as you see, and eventually the train was signalled off, and I remember leaning out and shaking hands with him, and little did I realise I would only see him alive once ever again when I visited Ipswich a number of years later. Anyway, I waved goodbye to him, and the train sped on its way in and as I turned around, I thought the compartment was empty. Here's a lady sitting in the opposite corner. I had never even noticed her. Very well presented, beautiful clothes on, a big hat with a feather, a lovely gold ring watch, and pearls the lot. You see, sort of typical dowager duchess type. And she got in conversation with me, you see. And uh, she said, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going home, I'm going north to Stirling. It's got oh yes, that's fine. And uh, where have you been? <coughs> I said, I've just been demobilized from the Royal Air Force. And she said, that, where have you been in the Royal Air Force? I said, oh, I've been out in the Far East, in Burma, actually, in the campaign against the Japanese. And there was a slight pause, and she turned and she said to me, young man, you would have one of the nice safe jobs in the RAF. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the flash, I answered, yes, ma'am, end of conversation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so she never even gave me a chance, you know. But that's what she said to me. She says, you would have one of the nice safe jobs in the RAF. <laughs> I was just thinking about the other body then, you know, <laughs> and, the, and the chicken. <laughs> so uh, 
I hope you've enjoyed what I've had to say. I maybe haven't just concentrated so much on the amateur radio because a lot of it is, is, is not maybe sort of old hat now to people, but a lot of people are interested in the other things, you know, the things which happened to me on the way and all the, the little bits and pieces which um, sort of put it in to um, a place. But as I say, uh, if you have any questions, anything at all, oh, one thing uh, I was going to um, show you uh, in the photograph, but I can hold it up. When I was in California and was asked to speak at the Southern California DX Club, uh, this is the picture. Uh, my friend Neil, who is in this picture with me, took. Uh, his girlfriend took this. This, this is me lecturing to the people in the Southern California DX Club. You see? <laughs> this, this here, you see? Uh, and I didn't know the girl had her camera his girlfriend in the, the hall, but she's already had too, and she brought the photographs to me a couple of days later. There's this one here, and a, the, the other one is a very good one. Neil and I were, this is Neil here, a, Neil and I were at a big swap meet a, in a Southern California, and we a, were larking about, and I should just read you what he's got on a, the front of his a, uh, singlet here. It's got the Institute for the Sexually Gifted. <laughs> he was a character and he's got, he's got his hand at my shoulder and uh, here uh, are the two of us here. I'll let you see them close up. He's waving and this is his stand, all the stuff we were flogging. We had put all the big stuff we had sold into the car and we were just getting ready to get rid of all this stuff here. You'll see the, the, the mountains in the background, the snow there. So as I say, it was Neil who took me his calls in this K6SMF, he took me to, um, uh, he was the past president of the uh, Southern California DX Company, invited me as, as a guest, you see, because I never realized I'd have to speak at the, um, the, um, the meeting, you see, but of course the main speaker didn't turn up, and I was sort of lumbered with this, so that's how I got to know, um, a, uh, how I got to know um, a Neil, and of course, as I say, I have a number of photographs here of various things. And I don't know if I, did I, did I tell you where I got this headset from, the first headset? No, did I describe, did I tell you that? No. Well, the day I, I really forgot about this, this was the first thing I ever I, I got, I ever I managed to pick up. The day I got to Imphal, and I was in the orderly room, I had looked out, as I say, in the quadrangle, there was this thing with um, Mr. Johnson, you see, the man who had given the money for the school. And the second time, or the third time, and I went round the back and walked up, I look at the whole school, and round the back of the, um, the, the uh, orderly room that had been used, this part of the school, was a heap of rubbish, old bits of metal and things, you see. And lying at my feet when I stood and turned around was an old headset. I picked it up and I said, that's an American headset. So by this time, you see, I had nothing. I hadn't even got the radio or any bits and pieces. And I said, this is for me, I might be able to make it work. So I took it back. Uh, and of course I could do nothing with it because I had no instruments. But I said, whenever I get to my unit, I'll check it with a naval. Well, I cleaned them up and I tied them up and uh, I carried the, uh, the, um, the headphones with me right uh, till I got into my unit. It was operational and we got some tools and I took the work and I cleaned them up and got it working. And this is the headset I actually use all the time, my little two ball set. And other than the fact that the cord is a bit uh, <laughs> ropey now, because it's rubber and it's perished, the headset's still working. It's an American Western Electric. And it was lying in that heap in the box in the box. So that's the sort of things I, I had to do to, to get bits and uh, pieces. But I have a, a photographs here and various things which I can show you. And also a map of Burma. I can show you a lot of the places that anyone is interested. But uh, probably at this stage I've said enough. But if there's anything you have, and then we have questions now before I show you the pictures, fire away. I'll do my best to answer any of your, your questions. Did you, did you make contacts back into the UK from Burma? No, it was strange. I only heard about three. I heard a GM, and it wasn't Duke because Duke was already on. He was home, you see, and I, I, I never heard it. I think I heard the 6MD, you know, McCady, yes, and someone else. That was all, but they were about S2, and uh, I never, I never found it. But I was, I was working into Europe, all right. I mean, I was working I1s and uh, SM and, you know, and people like that, French stations. But I never, I never worked any G or any, um, or any uh, uh, GM. And but what I, was but the you know, highest frequency band you operated? Well, I just operated in 20. You, 10 meters open. was open and wide open yeah. when I was there. But because I was tied up with other things, uh, I really didn't have time laterally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what really happened was I had to move up from the site at Victoria Lake where we were stationed to um, 
up near Ming Ladan Airport, that's the big airport of Rangoon. Uh, I was put in charge of three complete radars there, and I had to be there virtually all the time because there was a lot of work still to do. And the reason we had to keep them like that, there were pockets of Japanese, you see, we hadn't probably really rounded up, and we thought if they ever break out, we'll just send the fighters up and get them, so we had to have some operational equipment. So I had to do that. Uh, strangely enough, I was put in charge of my own unit and two other units lying uh, beside them, and as I said, they were all com complete, you see, just ready to sort of go, and, and I was tied up with that. So I really, I, if, I, if I'd had more time, I could have come on 10 meters. You see, because luckily I could borrow an HRO and an, an AR-88 and an SX-20, all the things the other signals people had had. But of course we didn't use them, you see, on radar, you see. But uh, as I say, that's the thing. So have you got any questions before I show you the, the photographs? Any other question? I think you've covered it very well. Well, if there's anything at all, as I say, you'd like to see, I'll let you, you see everything. I think time, time is getting on, it's getting late. Well, I think we should put our hands together. Yeah,